Well, greetings, everybody, and welcome to the newest meeting of Movie Club. I am, of course, uh, one of your chapter founders. My name is John Campia. It's great to have you here. And we, of course, are gathered here together today in our little quorum. There's donuts on the table, coffee over there. As we get together to discuss our favorite movies the last 25 years or so, and today is a big one, one of the most iconic, if not the quintessential, most iconic, I would wager, adventure film of all time. The movie that is the standard by which all other adventure movies ever since and ever will be measured by. We are here today to talk about Raiders of the Lost Ark, the original Indiana Jones film. And that's what we're going to do here today. Joining me, of course, sitting over here is Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Robert, we're here to talk about Indiana Jones. How are you feeling about it? Well, John, I mean, this film, uh, you know, I, when I first saw this movie, no one knew what it was about. Even if you'd watched the trailers, all we knew is that Harrison Ford was in it, and it was directed by Steven Spielberg and produced by George Lucas. Besides that, even the trailers, that first trailer, it's like, is this Noah's Ark? Is it a space ark? Like, what is this? And yet, we don't even know. By today's standards, it would have been heavily, heavily, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It would have been heavily, heavily criticized for giving away massive spoilers. Because one of the most iconic moments, if you remember, in Indiana Jones, probably one of the images that most people think about, is Indy's in the street and he comes face to face with the man in black with the red sash, and he pulls out the giant scimitar, swings it around, and he just, ah, pulls out his gun. They put that in the trailer. I know. That was in the trailer and for you, the movie. And famously, that scene was going to be a long, drawn-out battle. It's yeah. in the novelization, and it was uh, improvised. Yeah, and and Harrison Ford had dysentery. He was he couldn't stand up without having to go to the lavatory, <laughs> and uh, he just can't. He said to Spielberg, "Can I just shoot him?" And that's the what rest happened. is history. The rest is history. And by the way, maybe the best improv of all time, perhaps. And uh, the man who's used the phrase, "Can't we just shoot him?" more than anybody else. Ray Orr is joining us here today. Where's the donuts, baby? I'm looking for them, <laughs> dude. You're a it's Raiders virgin. Yeah, I know. An Indiana Jones virgin. Oh, Ray watched Indy. Raiders of the Lost Ark for the first time last night to prepare for this. We, got, we are getting fresh perspective. Pleasantly uh, surprised. Very surprised. The movie's not even that long. I actually paused every time I actually went to the kitchen to get something because I didn't want to miss a thing. Wow, no sleeping. No sleeping. I even, I, I got so hungry that I actually paused it and then I started cooking something because because I didn't want it just to like, you know, just hear it. I wanted to watch it like and focus on the film. I mean, it's I mean, we're doing an actual movie club on it. I didn't want to disrespect the movie or you guys, you know, so I paused it, but I watched it all the way through. I mean, yeah, it was it was it was a great surprise. I mean, it was fast. There was a lot of action. There was really no downtime. No, there's not. No. It was uh, it was the flow of it was perfect. I'm still not into these type of movies, but I'm glad I watched <laughs> this movie. It and uh, anyway, it. guys, here's how today's discussion is going to go. We're going to talk about Raiders of the Lost Ark here for the first half. And then in the second half, we're going to hear from you, the rest of the members of Movie Club, about things, your observations, your theories, your thoughts, your opinions, maybe your questions about Raiders of the Lost Ark. If you are watching us live, and only if you're watching and joining us live, of course, go ahead and use the Super Chat feature, and we'll get to those once we're done, our discussion about it. And I think maybe one of the places we should start with is, is right from the beginning. <laughs> the opening of this film is so iconic because I, I would propose that within the first five minutes, there are like four of the greatest moments in movie history. <laughs> so, like, first of all, right from the Paramount logo dissolving into the mountain that's actually there. Like, I remember at the time, like, that was like, whoa! Like, yeah. People were freaked <laughs> out by that. Like, today, it's commonplace that the studios will use their studio logo to dissolve into something that's similar to what's going on in the movie at the time. But at that time, that was crazy. And right from the beginning, we realized there is a multiverse. Because Doc Ock pops up... <laughs> As I think maybe the first guy on screen in the movie, Alfred Molina, pops up as uh, as uh, Indiana S Jones's tour guide. Cepito. Cepito. Adios, Cepito. As he takes, is taking him through the jungle. The man who uttered the immortal words, 
You throw me the idol, I throw you the whip. Again, one of the greatest, most iconic moments. But every, in that opening scene, everything from the turning around with the spiders on the back, the rolling boulder, the mm, as he swatches out the idol, then him coming out of the cave and seeing Cepito there, only the fall down dead. I mean, that the first five minutes of this movie have some of the most iconic imagery in the history of cinema. Well, not only that, John, John Williams' score. Oh, yes. One of the great scores in movie history, but the way his score begins with this mystery and it's drawing you in and everything is shot in silhouette, you know, South America, 1936 or whatever. And you're or 30, is it 38? No, it's 36. I think it's 36. And everything is, is, is in silhouette. And you don't know until <laughs> a gun is pulled. You hear a whip crack and Harrison Ford turns around and finally walks into the light after he's used his iconic bullwhip in his full glory. Yeah, because it was all silhouettes before that. One of the great openings and great character introductions in movie history. I have to say, My Albert, God. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, Robert. No, go right Albert ahead. Molina was very suspect to me from the minute he came on screen. I was <laughs> like, I don't know if it was just me or anyone else. I was like, this guy, you can't trust him. Just this whole look. I don't know if it was supposed to be obvious or not, but yeah. Well, look. His partner pulled a gun on Indy. At that point, Indy should have probably put his gun on him and said, you get out of here too. Right. You were with him. I mean, he should have got rid of him. So no big surprise that there was a big uh, evil turn at that point for Alfred Molina. No, it, but you know, like you pointed out, the five minutes, the 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 invading the temple, and sh and Indiana Jones is shown as being the ultimate badass. He's five steps ahead of all the traps. He knows what to do, and even then, he gets all the way into the temple, and there is the idol, you know. And you think that this guy knows what's up. He's balancing the sand in the bag he's brought with him, you know. And then he does the changeover, and you think, all right. And then there's that pause and that awesome moment where the little place where that idol was sitting goes, yeah. and then you hear whatever traps, the gears and the noise, and, and then you see Indiana Jones freaked out. Like our hero, he's like, oh, fuck. you know, <laughs> and he starts running and all hell is breaking loose. The arrows that he's evaded are firing at him. I mean, and then he finds, you know, Cepito, and like you said, through the whole temple, barely makes it out alive. The boulder comes down, and after all that, after all that, he looks up, and there are the Jovitos with, with weapons, their arrows pointed at him, and there is a Natalie dressed Frenchman in a perfectly white linen suit. Once again, we see there's, there's nothing, nothing you, can you can possess, possess which I, I cannot, cannot take, take away. away. And oh, then, oh, hold on, we got to go over that Alfred Mar Molina's uh, his demise. That was, oh, that was that gruesome. was the very first, I was like, this is not Disney, because in my head, since Disney is doing Indiana Jones now, I was just, I went into it, and even the Paramount You're logo, expecting yeah, I thought Disney it was like movie. Disney and Steven Spielberg, I'm used to like, oh, this is going to be, they're not going to show, dude, the dude got speared through the head, and dude, Spielberg the directed Jaws, yeah, <laughs> but yeah. I, you know, it's still crazy, I mean, I, I, I was like, okay, this is I'm in for something now. If they if that's in the first five minutes, you know what I mean? No, I, you're right. I mean, th this movie is brutal. It is. It's fast and bloody. It doesn't shy away from the violence, and it, it which gives it that modern. I mean, it's a pulp sensibility from like the '40s, the cliffhangers and all that. But it does it so well, and I I just love that moment where you have these two the the antagonist, the protagonist squaring off. And uh, Indiana Jones says, too bad the Jovitos don't know you the way I do, Belloc. And then Belloc's like, yeah, it's too bad. Perhaps you could warn them if only you spoke Jovitos. And then it's like, it's like, he just, and, and he ha puts his hand out and Indiana Jones puts the, puts the idol in his hand. And then he takes off and books and he's chased by the whole tribe. And it's just, this is Spielberg at the height of his powers. Now it should be noted that Spielberg was coming off in 1941, which yes. was not, which not was kind of a, a debacle. Yeah, <laughs> and it was huge. It went way over budget. And Lucas, George Lucas, told Spielberg that I'm hiring you to do this, but you need to. You got to come in on time and on budget. No, no extravagant excesses. So Spielberg was really 
There was a lot of planning and storyboarding that went into this, but he was at the height of his game. That He was a man possessed because this is one of the best directed movies, I think, ever right. in the history of cinema. Every shot, the, there's not the a way, wasted angle. That moment in the film when, when he switches the idol for the sandbag, not only is that one of the most iconic moments in film history, but it also does something else. Because in the beginning of this movie, Rob, as you pointed out, we have the coolest introduction to this guy. It's all from behind silhouette. He only comes in light after he's cracked out his whip and hit the knocked the gun out of the guy's hands and all that kind of stuff. We see him walking the temple. The spider's on his back. Ah, what an irritation. He doesn't freak out. All that stuff. But the reason I love that moment when he swaps the bag out for the idols because at the same time that they're setting up how cool he is, they immediately set up that he is not infallible. Right. Because one of the very first important decisions he makes in the movie, he guesses wrong. And he misjudges the weight, and the whole the thing sinks, and the ball is going to come down on him. Again, another one of the most iconic moments in the history of sin. If you ever go to Disneyland and do the Indiana Jones ride, you know very well the big ball scene. But I like that. And the thing about Belloc is that he isn't just a mustache twirling villain. He is legitimately Indiana Jones' equal, if not smarter than Jones. Yeah. Because he, he literally, all through the movie, right up into the point where they're in the city and he goes into the bar and he's already there waiting for him, he has outthought Indiana yep. every step of the way at that point. So and he really set him up as a great foil. And lets Indiana Jones do all the hard work. Yes. You know, he's all, not only has he outthought him, he's like, let's just wait here. He'll be here. Don't worry. I mean, you're absolutely right, John. And and it's this kind of writing. We should point out that Lawrence Kasdan uh, wrote this film. Yeah. He wrote the screenplay later. He'd written The Empire Strikes Back with Lee Brackett the year before. And Philip Kaufman, who came up with a story with George Lucas for this, had directed The Wanderers and Invasion of the Body Snatchers and um, went on to make The Right Stuff, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. So the pedigree of everybody working on this film, I mean, they were everybody was firing on all cylinders there's a great group of people making this movie uh belloc is what we would today call a troll he was like indiana, uh, he was trolling true. indiana jones that's the whole absolutely time true. <laughs> and what's funny is when indiana jones takes off uh, from the tribe you could see the power of shoes because every shot the he gets further he gets further and further away <laughs> from the tribe because they're so close at first the and then all of a sudden, shoes. this guy is just breaking away. And I was like, it's, it has to be the shoes. There has to be something on that ground where they're like, oh, you know what I mean? So that part where I haven't seen one of those uh, land, sea, air. Uh, things, a biplane. Yeah, yeah. That he it, uh, takes off on in a long time. It's really nice to see because I, I, I want to see those more. I haven't seen those in a long time. And by the way. The stormtroopers have got nothing on the Jovitos <laughs> because their aim is terrible. There's actually a moment when I was watching it, I was watching some moments of it again earlier today. But when Jones is about to dive into the water, <laughs> the Jovitos are no more than like 10 yards behind. <laughs> exactly. Him. And one of them grabs the spear and throws, and like Jones is right here. He's 10 feet away, and the spear literally goes like, like way <laughs> over that way. They were even spinning darts at him like super fast, but they were on point at that cave. Oh, for some reason. the guy that fell over? Yeah. They had pinpoint accuracy, 30 darts in the I guy. I think they planted those in his back after they killed him. Probably. To make it look like they had a half decent shot. Shoes. They were tired. <laughs> and, and of course, too tired. you get the first Star Wars reference with the uh, the number of the biplane. You know, it's CPO. Oh, I didn't notice yeah, that. Yeah, if you look at it again, the, the, there's many. R2 and 3PO are actually in the Well of the Souls later, but it's hard to see them. But, you know, um, the, the uh, a, and again, you're introduced to yet another thing about Indiana Jones. You're introduced to his great fear which is snakes <laughs> snakes yeah there's a snake in the plane jock i can totally relate to that well, I, I, i'm terrified of snakes. but then oh, what's part maybe the greatest callback in movie history that moment right at the beginning is not just i hate it but th then later it pays off when they get to the well of souls and then you knew that and then you realize oh my god that was all a setup for this it was like one of the best callbacks ever <clears> and it's film. so good and and i love that jock you see jock when you first see him as Indiana Jones is running back the plane, he's caught something. He's hooked a fish, and it's a big fish. And he's like, he's fighting the fish, and he's looking at Indiana Jones. He's fighting the fish, and he's like, 
maybe I can still get the fish. Maybe I can still get the fish. And he eventually has to let go of it. He lets go of the fishing line to save Indiana Jones's life. And all throughout this movie, there's all of this wit. There's all this character moment. And it's so great. Like, you never see Jacques again. But when he says, oh, it's just my pet snake, Reggie, show a little backbone, would you? By the As way, they fly off into the sunset. What did you just call the pilot of the plane? Jacques. I've always called him Jacques. When I sat down just to watch a few moments of it again today, I, I had, um, it was on Paramount Plus, and I guess from the last thing I'd watched, I still had subtitles on. It's not Jacques. You know, what the, you know what it says in subtitles? Jacques. J-O-C-K. Oh, you know what? It probably is. I said Jacques. I've always thought Jacques. I've always thought Jacques. And I thought, well, maybe with Belloc, there maybe there's some kind of thing. And I always thought it was Jacques. But according to the subtitles, it's Jock. Jock makes Jock makes sense. You know what? See, you learn something every day on Movie Club. I've watched this movie for 41 <laughs> years and never. The Speaking of audio, here's something I, I kind of picked up on, like right at the beginning. And it was very apparent when him and the, the lady started talking. There's a I don't know if it was my speakers or whatever. There's a little disconnect in the 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 voice i don't know if that's because it's an older movie but i had to double check to see if i had it set on a different language sometimes hmm. it felt like they were talking in a different like you know but that's just like technical issues i don't want to bring that to light but i don't know if the, you guys noticed it well listen the reality is raiders of the lost ark is a movie fraught with technical problems for a technical from you know, uh, the equipment point of view, technical for stunts going awry and not working properly, technical from things being in the shot that shouldn't, shouldn't be in the shot, technical from things being one way as the camera looked another angle, then when the camera changed angles, something was completely different. I mean, what the most famous of that, of course, is when Marion, it's after Indy leaves her bar, and Marion is now by herself, and she sits down, she reaches into her shirt, and she pulls out the Eye of Ra. And there's a profile showing that it's in, on a chain around her neck. And you see the chain still connected to the Staff Ra still around her neck. And then the camera changes angles, and the chain is no longer around her neck. One of the best, though, is near the end, when Belloc, well, Indiana Jones has got the bazooka. He's got to point it at oh, the Ark of the Covenant. Oh, yeah, the cameo. No. And Belloc is standing there. And if you pay attention, who I can't remember the name of the actor who played Belloc, but give that man an Academy Award, even if it's an honorary one. Because if you watch, there is a fly harassing him as he's talking to Dr. Jones. Go ahead, do it. And you see at one point the fly literally lands on his face and walks into his mouth, and he doesn't break character nope. for a second. I'm talking about that's the cameo I'm talking about. Oh, you're talking about the fly? Yeah, the, the cameo, cameo, the fly. <laughs> Everyone knows a fly. It was we, at my house guys, yesterday. We're jumping ahead of ourselves. I know. Here. I know. I know. Come on. I know. It's quite the techno, the little technical things in there too. But anyway, we we get out of the thing, and then he goes back to the university. Well, which is here's the thing: when you're watching this, when I I have so many. I, I my first time seeing this movie was so it's burned into my mind because you didn't know anything about this. You didn't, you hadn't met this character, and the idea that you saw this rough and tumble guy as an academic in a tweed jacket addressing a a, a class and all the girls are in love with him they're all swooning over him love you Lo it's yeah oh, the, the eye the eyelid thing is psychotic so, and then and then uh, as the as the class breaks the bell rings one of the kids leaves an apple on his desk because you used to always give your teachers apples and immediately I mean, marcus takes it yeah marcus takes it and then you meet denholm elliott as marcus brody yep well, the, one of the most important characters in this entire franchise yeah and and it is they talk about these pieces. They're good pieces, Marcus. Oh, yes. Very I know nice. you can only sell in one place, you know, Marrakesh or whatever. And uh, I need $3,000. $2,000. dollars It gave me an idea of how long he's been doing this, like researching yes. this, like how into it. When you're into a particular hobby, you you have everything. You know everything. And it, it, that's what it showed. That, that part right there showed me how much he's into this stuff. He has a regular job, but... This is his passion, right? Yeah. And then one of the, you know, they always talk about in screenwriting class, show, don't tell. This movie flies in the face of that, and you have almost a nine-minute sequence where where Indiana Jones in the meets, lecture room and the let meets with the two the two government, government agents. Yeah. And it is Mr. Basil Exposition. And I mean, they literally you got these guys sitting down, and Indiana Jones. 
in, in any screenwriting course, they'll tell you, boy, this scene, if you were to write this scene today, people would say, this doesn't work. You, you have to have them do something. And it's great. You're like riveted. And you, you learn about Abner Ravenwood. I, I, and I you, was sitting in the classroom with them. Yeah. I, I, I mean, right? It is a riveting scene. And you see that Indiana Jones, like he's carrying around like this ancient, like thousand year old Bible that has a lock on it that he probably stole from the Vatican. How cool. By the way, it, Ray was talking about sound earlier. One of the coolest sounds ever is the unbuckling of old books. And as, as it just so happens, they have this two and a half foot tall tome sitting on the desk. Well, Ark of the Covenant, what does it look like? But we have a picture right here. And then it goes over to this huge old book and the sound of the unbuckling. It just makes me want to own old books. Dude, it's you're awesome. <laughs> first of all, we got to shout out the sound design in this movie. Yes. The best gunshots in any movie, these these full, I mean, sound, everything sounds like a cannon. It's the, the, the fist fights. The, you punch some dude and man, it, it is, it's got fury and sound. It's amazing. And then, of course, you know, John Williams, it's people sitting around a desk, you know, and Indiana Jones opens up a page and you see, you see, my da, God. Da, da, totally, da, dude. Da. That just so perfectly plays with the scene. And the dialogue is so great. And and they open it up, my God, yes, that's just what the Hebrews thought. I mean, yeah, the, the lines of dialogue is so great. What's coming out? Power, but power even God. Because, like, he's educated them. It's like, uh, what is the, the well of souls and the staff of Ra? It's like... Well, and he just flips well, over the chalkboard, and Look. he goes into the classroom, right? And he's drawing it out. The Campia like, classroom. And yes, he pulls out the Campia classroom. That's exactly what he did. And like you're sitting there with him, and he's basically laying out the stages of the movie that we're about to go through. Right. Right. He's laying out a blueprint for the movie and where we're about to go in the adventure. And I remember that was actually one of the more riveting parts of the movie, just sitting there taking these two government guys to school and teaching them about this. And opening old books, and it was like just the greatest thing ever. Because we, the audience, are them. Yes. We're literally, we, we might as well be the government agents. We're, it's, the staff is just sick. You put the, the right place at the right time, and the sun shines through the head and gives you the location of the well of the souls. And one guy's like, where the Ark, and, Ark of the Covenant is kept. That's like, see, yes. I'm paying attention, Professor. Yeah. I mean, it's so, it, it, it's, it's just like, I mean, dude, this what? movie is so much fun. You know what? What do you think? Is it fun? Is this, Am I wrong? Oh, no, but we see, like, yes, of course it is. I mean, look, I used my free month of Paramount Plus to watch this movie. <laughs> <laughs> and it's going to cut off right after the first episode of Halo. So you knew. You know, you know that meant a lot to him then. You know, yeah. So Well, you got three more movies to watch. It, it's like Clark Kent. This version in, in the school, it reminded me of... Oh, wow. that's a good example. Like yeah, It's yeah. like the smart, you know, like, you know, just like very... To, you know, to himself. The professor. Yeah, the professor. It's but then Kent. all he has to do is just unbutton that top collar, take off that jacket, <laughs> put on and it's hat. like Superman right there. <laughs> it's true. That, that, that really is the difference between Clark Kent and Superman when you That's see them in those two different right. worlds. You know, I never thought of it that way, but you're absolutely right. <laughs> but you know, what, too, this is where it gets kind of real in a sense, that after this, we go to Indy's home, and Brody's in there with him and Brody goes into this speech about, you know, for 3000 years, man, a search for the Ark of the Covenant. I mean, and, and, he, and he going on and the, again, the music that's playing with it as, as Brody kind of starts to stare off, like he's not looking at Indy. He's kind of staring off and starts. It's like nothing you've ever gone. It's like nothing you've ever before. gone after before. And then we see the juxtaposition of that mindset versus Indy's he goes, what are you trying to do? Scare me? No, I don't believe in any of this hocus pocus, <laughs> you know, all this kind of stuff. So it accomplishes so much because where you're talking about how this movie's always moving, it's yeah. always moving. And it's like, it goes from, even when it's a quiet scene of two guys talking in a room, there is action happening. Information. In, whether it's information being communicated, like vital information being communicated, depth of character being expanded upon, movement like it's everything something is always happening with every single second of this movie steven spielberg is one of the most efficient filmmakers because he wastes not a frame oh and not only that if you talk about how this is directed <clears throat> when you watch this movie again and you will um watch how people move around the room and how the cameras adjust and how he yeah. uses the coverage but another thing that happens in this scene you think she'll be with him 
Oh, you yeah. know, and the, suddenly the reference to Marion. Oh, there's a there's a woman involved, and something happened between them, and you're getting all of this information, and it's in a fascinating, fun, interesting. And at the same time, Indiana Jones is packing. You're seeing the iconic jacket in his yeah. suitcase. And then, of course, you know what a careful guy I am or whatever. And he throws yeah, a gun into his a gun. Can't get that through uh, security these days. Uh, but it's the whole scene is is just. And this is one of the first times ever in movie history. Some of this is used all the time now. But it's the first time I remember. I'm, I'm sure it was used before. That I remember that you they pulled out the mechanism of. Guy gets on a plane, fade out to a map, and then follow a dotted line or a line going along a map and stuff like that. Now, a thousand movies have done it since. They did it in Uncharted. Yes, they did. They do it in a lot of... But, and maybe it was done before that, but it was the first time I ever remember seeing that in a movie. But even before that, when you get to that, it's a great ILM. It's a matte painting of the plane. And, and yes. look, some of the effects are very dated in this movie. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, they but, are. But it, it feels like, because the movie's supposed to take place in the 30s, it works. But I love the fact that when Indiana Jones is on this plane and everyone's dressed up in their Sunday finest, because that's how you traveled back in the day, you see that on the plane, there are bad dudes. You know, they're looking at papers. You know, you don't mm -hmm. see they're, they're covered. But, but, but the way it's, it, this is a throwback to the 30s and 40s. But immediately, you know, Indiana Jones is being followed. How he's being followed, we don't know. But he's being followed. There are nefarious people following indiana jones and you know there's peril and then it goes into the and by the way the music again the travel music it's, it's william score again one of the best most effective music scores ever written which is exactly why they should give out the oscar for the best original score during the actual broadcast you know i just wanted to bring up when he's packing up and like all of them are just like trying to warn him and they're all cautious indiana jones is like a hitman but instead of going after a target like a kill target he's a hitman towards an artifact like he's very focused he doesn't let any of the outside noise there's one main goal and just to get that thing you want this thing i'm gonna get it for you or get it for me right you're right and that's what i that's what i really like about the character because it reminds me of myself sometimes when it if if it's there's something i'm passionate that i want to get oh you don't have enough money Oh, you know, <laughs> I'm going to get it. <laughs> By the way, uh, going back to the, the classroom scene with the two government guys, did you, did you guys catch who one of the government guys was? It's Porkins. It's Porkins. Porkins, from? who died over the Battle of the Death Star. From Star Wars. Oh, He's okay. uh, the actual yeah. pilot who gets shot down. You know, it reminded me, because I remember when I was watching Game of Thrones for the first time, and the... the uh, What's the the guy's name? Not the mice, the Meister. What were, what was this called? The, the the scholars. They were called the oh oh yeah the, the Meisters. Meisters, yeah. yeah. The so the Meister, the king. I was like, why does that guy look so familiar? It's the ATAT -AT commander from Empire Strikes oh my Back. God. <laughs> and Julian he was, Glover. And he was in Indiana Jones. He was the bad guy in Indiana Last Jones Crusade. and the Last Crusade. Yep. It's just good to see the Star Wars is Indiana that, Jones is, connections is, is alive a, and well. Is that a common thing for that to happen? For like maybe back then, maybe they just had like a turntable of actors. Well, that even they would today, just... uh, it's all it's common that a director likes to work with some of the same. And they people would shoot in England, lot. so these guys were all British. You know, they were guys in in, in England. But yeah. you know, you know, it's real. What I, another character bit for you, all you budding screenwriters out there? The fact that when the plane is about to take off, Indiana Jones before the plane's even taken off, he takes his hat off, leans back, puts it over his head, and goes to sleep. Mm -hmm. He has no worries in the world. Nothing phases him. Yep. He's not scared of traveling. This is all par for the course. Just par for and the course. And we learn so much. Now, we fast forward a little bit now, and we get to the bar. Nepal. To Marion's bar. Marion Ravens, yeah. And instantly, again, Steven Spielberg accomplishes multiple things with single scenes. Because not only is he establishing the environment that she's in, we're instantly establishing that Marion is tougher than you. <laughs> that Marion has bigger balls than you. And she's gorgeous. And she's she's beautiful and she can drink anybody under the table. Again, something that Spielberg uses to call back to later in the film as she's arranging her own escape from Belloc, right? To get him drunk while she pretends to be drunk. drinking the Sherpas, man. Like doing all that kind of stuff. 
Indy comes in. They have their whole discussion about their father. But I was a child. And, and all I that. I was in love. I was in love. It was like so well done. So well set up. And then ultimately when he leaves, and again, that moment where she's alone, she pulls out the shirt, the, the, uh, pulls out the, the, the uh, headpiece of the staff of Raw. And then we meet, who to me as a kid was some, one of the most terrifying characters you could ever have. I can't remember, what was the guy's name? Tote. 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 Good evening, we, we Froline. Oh, thirsty. Man. It's like, oh my God. God, that guy was terrifying to me. Ronald Lacey, I think is his it name. It reminded me of the Charlie and the Cho Chocolate Factory guy. That's who terrified me. Mr. <laughs> well, the one who offers Charlie the jawbreaker and says, oh, give me the secrets or whatever of Wonka. Oh, I Do don't you remember, remember that movie. I remember they the movie. Met, I don't remember. They the met him in the tunnel. Him. He had the black hat, you know, with the glasses. It kind of reminded me of him. I don't, <laughs> but he, again, so, they kind of look alike. Yeah, they do. So he comes in. Andy comes back. The fight ensues. The bar burns. And then again, something gets called back to later. Todd grabs the, uh, the headpiece of the staff. Of I mean, this is the first head. other new action scene in the film. And that mm -hmm. gunfight is yep. off. Yeah. The gunfight and all the suspense. He just, Spielberg masterfully By the way, everybody in the live chat says the guy's name was Slugworth. Slugworth. Slug, there, there you go. go. Yes, that's right. But in this scene, the way, first of all, uh, <laughs> Marion even is defiant against the Nazis. Listen, Air Mac. You know, Air Mac. <laughs> right. I mean, it's so. And uh, can I get you a drink for you and your men or whatever? And it, it builds, it builds, it builds, and then and then suddenly they're gonna rough her up. And you, again, you hear the door open, and there's the the silhouette, the, the the shadow of Indiana Jones. And this action sequence is incredible. And like a great serial, the scene builds and builds and builds. Liquor is spilled. Flames break out. The whole place is is burning while they're having this gunfight, and it's it's like that great scene with it when the line of fire is burning right toward his head, and Indiana's just like whiskey, and she gives him the oh, bottle and he just clocks the guy in the head. I the mean, whispering sound of whiskey. It it's perfect. I mean, I, so, dude, no one can stage a scene. This is why you know people talk about Steven Spielberg. He just thought cinematically. His yeah. shot choices, I mean, the way he could build the sequence. Yeah. And and nowadays, you have previs people, and there was previs on these scenes, but Spielberg was there. He was figuring all this stuff out, and it's coming right out of his head. These shot choices are brilliant. The gun battle is brilliant. The sound of the gunfire. By the way, somebody's Dude. pointing out, Rocketman in the live chat, and I guess I want to address, address this. Rocketman in the live chat says there's a slight criticism. Marion looked like she was about to hit the floor during the drinking contest, yet she's stone sober when she talks to Indy. Yes, because that was part of her scam. That was her hustle. Because she does it again later in the film with Belloc. She's convinced as Belloc, aha, I'm so drunk, I'm so drunk. High tolerance. Until it was time to pull out her ace. And I think she was you. She was, she's playing the long con with not just the guy she was drinking against, but all the other suckers in the bar, because that's her hustle, and that's her con. That's so, exactly right. Just wanted to point that out. And, and it, uh, we've we got to move things along. Yeah, we're already yeah. more than thirty five minutes into this. Oh man, where I should love we go movie. next? Where do we go next after well, that? Well, I mean, you know, then he travels all the way. You get to you get to Cairo, and you meet Johnny yes. Davies. You meet Sala, who, who probably, other than Indy himself, the most celebrated character in the best digger in Cairo. Oh, and she's and, his partner now. They, they, oh, yeah, you're, before, after you're the bar, partner. we're goddamn partners, yep. you know? And so the two of them are there and the, the bulk of the movie, the, the, the entire next hour, pretty much is set in Cairo and, and it's like Casablanca. It's, 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 you've got, you've got the Nazis, but the war hasn't broken out yet. Oh, the annoying monkey. The, the, oh, the, the rat who the dies squeal, from the bad the squealers. Date. It's a bad date. Uh, I mean, this is all <laughs> plot developing and mystique and, you know, leading up to the whole. And by the way, true, this is what I missed from Uncharted. When they finally find the map room, you know, and Indiana Jones gets the headpiece on the Very staff well of Very well preserved map, map room, by the way. Very well preserved. Well, you know, it's, 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 it's power of God, man. <laughs> power of God. But when with the with the John Williams score and the the sun coming up and and the, the the even the effect shot when the light comes through and there's wonder and magic there and, and that's I, what I missed from Uncharted. That I was missed a great the magic. part. Yeah. I, I really like that part. Can I get one little criticism? 
So at this point, it's just supposed to be, it's literally rock, light hits it, and it refracts light. Except that scene turns supernatural. Because at one moment it becomes then like this multicolored laser that makes this laser sound effect. Because there's a light going down, and you hear the music, da, 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 and the light goes down, and all of a sudden it goes, Phew! When it makes this laser sounds like that's not what I, I, I light does when it it's, passes It's the headpiece resonating. It's making a sound. Oh, it's making it. a that sound. Makes more sense making now. A I'm a sucker for things like that. If you guys ever played like the room on the Android, where you put pieces and then all of a sudden everything moves and you open up a new level, yeah, that's like one of those puzzle games. I love when they do that in the movie, where some things that you don't think go belong together. It fits, and all of a sudden, a whole new world is open. I love that stuff. I don't know. Yeah, why. John, it's just vibrating like when you lick your finger and rub it on the top of a glass, and it goes ooh, and completely that's, change color of light. That's and, right. But that's it's what, all good. It's, it's all good. And then, and then Sala lets down the, the 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 the. He had to tie together a bunch of uh, Nazi blankets, flags. whatever, and it, the one that comes down at the bottom is a Nazi flag. And it's great. And then you know, Jones cracks the staff in half, you know. Yeah, because and... they couldn't put it back together again. Oh, and we, uh, we, we forgot to mention one thing. In the bar in Nepal, uh, Tote sees the headpiece of the staff of Ron, tries to reach in and grab it. And that's iconic. And he's... Ah! And it sizzles into his hand, sizzle, but only one hat, one side, <laughs> and take back one kadam for the Hebrew God whose office is. It's so great. It, by the way, I forgot to mention one of my favorite shots, as as he goes into Marion's bar with his thugs. No, sorry, it's, it's a little bit later in Belloc's tent, when he comes into the tent with his thugs, and. He pulls out what you think is like nunchucks. Right. It's like, oh no. And the, then the camera cuts to Belloc and Marion's faces, like, oh no, what's it going to do to us? And, and he just turns into a coat hanger. I'm like, okay, this is this is brilliant. And it's this funny. He's so good. He also sees Marion in the dress and he's like, you Americans, you're all the same. Always overdressing for the wrong occasion. Which was funny <laughs> because look at the suit he's wearing <laughs> in that shot, which I've in always the thought in the desert. Which I always thought made for a pretty weird insult, considering the way he was dressed at that time. And we already talked about the great chase sequence and the ba the basket chase sequence and the well, Cairo can I, swords. Can I point man. this out too the, with the basket sequence? I don't know. Like, look, you cannot show me a movie today where a death scene of a major character fools me, it, or any of us, right? That <laughs> fooled me. I remember when I watched it. Granted, I was a kid, right? But I was. The way they did it, convinced Marion died, and he was, and and she was dead. And even rewatching it now, you think they actually did that very convincingly. They did. I actually thought she's dead, and yeah, I was like, you just watched it for the first I time. I was like, oh my god, they killed her already. And then in my head already, I was like, I don't know what kind of confirmed it. I think it was the moment where he mentions it to the one his the other guy there. What's that uh, guy? Who, uh, I was Sala. talking about earlier. Sala. Sala. When he's like, Marion's dead, she, he was like, I know, or yes, whatever. Yes, I know. <laughs> I, I was like, oh, she really is gone. I really thought she was dead. So, yeah, it worked on me. And the way, again, John Williams' score and, and the physical, the actual practical explosion when the truck explodes, yeah. I mean, it's pretty definitive. And then there's that great shot where you cut to the bar when Indiana Jones is just drinking. You know, Which, if the, I'm not mistaken... We were speaking about some technical problems for I believe as he's drinking in the bar, I believe there's a there's a modern airplane that flies uh, yeah. through the sky behind his head, <laughs> if I'm not mistaken. But again, yeah, but that's when we run into Belloc again. And again, Belloc showing I will outsmart you every step of the way because he's you know, he says, I'll kill you. This is a pretty public place for murder. He goes, Ah, these Arabs won't mind us taking our bet only to find out no 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 they're all these they're all planted there by Belloc. Yeah. Like again, he's like three steps ahead of him. And there is there is a great scene we skipped over that I love when when Indiana Jones first gets to Cairo and they're talking to Sala and Sala's like, there is one amongst them. He is very smart. They call him Belosh. Yes. You know, and that's when Indiana Jones realizes, oh my God, he's here before me again. Yeah. Like he's already in Cairo, just like right. you had said. He's he literally just took the idol from me. The right. troll. The troll the of troll Indiana. Got on a plane and flew directly here. And he's already like working for the German government. Yeah. Like he's employed by the very best people. And can we talk about the next brutal death scene with that guy who's fighting at, at, near the plane? Oh, oh, that comes late. 
but that's... Oh, all right. My skipping well, first, too far ahead. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, let's yeah. talk about the Well of Souls first. Oh, dude. Because a couple of interesting things happened in the Well of Souls. First of all, we got the great callback to the I Hate Snakes. And let me point out something else, too. Something that movies don't do nearly as well as they used to. And what Spielberg did so masterfully was with a lot of today's movies to get the audience to feel excitement and tension, rapid camera edits, super fast motion and action always has to be happening. In Indiana Jones and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, it's simple premises that create massive tension. Even just a simple thing of Indy slowly lowering down into the well of souls, the tension is huge. It's massive. Marion just standing there as Indy's trying to knock over an 18,000 ton statue by just rocking his legs on it, but we'll get to that in a minute. But she just the camera cutting to her and slowly watching the fire on her torch going out, Indy, the torch is going out, and then cutting back to her again and the look of panic on her face, just little simple things like that creating incredible moments of tension for the audience, and not a lot of filmmakers know how to do that anymore. No, and also all of these shots are storytelling. Yes. And there's not a wasted shot. Every single shot, I mean, my uh, philosophy of editing is you never cut until you have to convey new information. Mm. If a shot runs out of conveying new information, you cut away to another shot. And that shot also should convey a new piece of information. Spielberg is a master of that. There is not a wasted shot in these movies, not a wasted angle. You learn something new, and that's what pulls you along. That's why the story, even in, in scenes where they're not breakneck paced, there's the, like you just pointed out, John, the tension. You know, mm. you can cut it with a knife. It's like it, pull, it pulls a wire. It's like a garrote on your throat. It's really beautifully done. You know, Spielberg right here, like it, it's, this is like earlier work from present. It shows me how much he's improved because he did end up doing Terminal, baby. <laughs> he's got better and Shout better. Terminal. <laughs> and better. But going back down into the Well of Souls, like there's, there's a common problem in the movie, though, with weight. Because, first of all, Sala goes down the Well of Souls with them, and we realize the Ark of the Covenant's inside this, cat or this tomb of some sorts. And then you see Sala and Indy on each side of it, and they lift what I'm sorry is minimum two to 3,000 pounds of giant massive stone that just these two guys, ah, just make sure you lift with your back or lift with your legs, not your back. It could be back. sandstone. You never know. It looks like chocolate to me. Lift, they <laughs> lift this giant stone up and then, again, have to have been six, seven ton statue that Indy just uses his legs to rock back and forth and knock over. And then... I got to say, by the way, this is one of my favorite scenes in the movie, right? I'm, I'm just pointing out the ridiculous stuff, but this is absolutely a brilliant scene. But as the statue falls over, true story, the statue didn't fall right. If you watch the movie, it kind of tilts more on an angle and kind of falls to the side along the wall. But it was still enough of an impact to make the stones fall. But the way it was all, it wasn't digital. They couldn't do it again. They couldn't set it up and shoot the scene again. So but they had to just take it as it is. But here's another funny part. So that one wall comes down and they're able to go through into another chamber where there's another wall of stones, had to be six, 700 pound stone that Indy just pushed out and he's looking over to the German airfield. Now we talked about this in Uncharted and other things do this too. Another Indiana Jones, uh, Last Crusade did this as well. So as it turns out, this little building right here with the square blocks right beside our airplane, all we had to do was look through that window and we would have found the Well of Souls. <laughs> like it was literally right here the entire yeah, time. See? Kind of like when, when Indiana Jones... But there wasn't uh, a window. They, he had to push out the Jenga block, you know. Uh, yes, that 800-pound that Jenga that's why block. I could do it. That's why I could do it. There's, there wasn't any pressure on. He just slid it through. The, the, the Nazis did not have the technology to move those rocks. But it reminded me a lot about... Um, uh, last Crusade, when Elsa and Indy find the last, um, uh, what's the name of the, the soldiers again? The, the ancient soldiers. They were called the Templar. Yeah. When they find the last night Templar, and they had to get out, they just go up through a manhole cover. 
And then into a cafe in the city, you realize, so this whole time, anybody could have just gone down to that manhole cover and found the oh, last time. Uncharted. No, no, but Uncharted did that a lot, too. This something That's something. Oh, that's from, something that happened in Crusade? Yes. That's, that's something that, that happened that last just sounded like well. Uncharted. <laughs> but, but there is a few things of that. But then that all leads us to what you were just talking about. Yeah. Well, first of all, a Nazi flying wing is badass. That looks slick. Yeah, I mean, it was... And and that scene, again, they're, they're gas gassing it up and there's some big dude and and what happens oh oh no there's this is literally the first time i think where indiana jones is literally getting his ass kicked yeah a brutal oh, yeah. fight brutal fight like anytime he got the upper hand that guy just knocked him back down and well i loved it the first jab the guy gives him and he's still on his feet for a second and then just falls down to his ass it was awesome but it shows you his perseverance too yes especially when he's protecting i i took it as he's He's really getting up because he's trying to protect this girl, not trying to get away. I think the girl was more important at that moment. I don't know. Yeah, that's that, for me. By the way, that's indie producer. Wait, we can. I can't believe it. We've skipped over the entire truck chase, guys. The truck. Oh chase. yeah, when he's hanging the. Oh no, we haven't because they're gonna fly it out of there and it blows up. That's yeah, coming. It's out. after the plane. But it's yeah, it's Frank Marshall, producer Frank Marshall, yes. who's get who gets clocked in the head. He's the Nazi pilot that. I never realized yeah, that. That's, that's actually Frank Marshall, Kathleen Kennedy's husband, who gets clocked in the head, who's on the plane. And she uses that big gun to destroy that truck. Yeah. Da -da 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 Which is, exactly. again, awesome. And what do they do? The flame burning down, the you know, the, yeah. the creation of tension. Great use of fire in this. Every everything, every time that fire was on screen, there was like some use to it, or like it killed someone, or it there was a, some explosion. I I like the way they use fire. Like going back to that first bar scene where that guy was on fire. Well, and it's all I gotta tell you, it's all real fire. It's now it'd yeah, all be CG. That's, that's, that's what I appreciated stuff. about the movie a lot. Yeah. Because I, I could think about how it was back then, and then you get a more you appreciate a lot of what he did more. Oh yeah. And then but that leads into a theme that kind of then starts happening where for some reason the Nazis feel like they need to be on the run. Jones still let, let's get the Ark out of here. Quick. Because Jones is going to come and take us all out and take the Ark for himself. Well, they but also have still, to get it to the Fuhrer. The Fuhrer thinks, get to the you know, they, they, and, they, and time's it. ticking. And they got to go, and that leads us into... Yeah, I can't believe I was getting my order wrong. See, I'm so excited about talking about this movie, John. One of my favorite action sequences in any movie ever, which is the truck chase. Indiana Jones, truck, what truck? Uh, if you still want the Ark, it is being loaded on a truck for Cairo. And what's great about this whole scene is if you watch this... Spielberg creates an obstacle for Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones surmounts that obstacle, and then Spielberg makes a bigger obstacle. You know, and and it, it's just the whole thing. When he gets on the truck, he fights his way to the fights through the Nazis, gets to the truck cab, fights the guy driving the truck, gets thrown out of the truck, uh, ends up so underneath great. underneath the truck. You know, and then he has to get back on the truck, and they have to fight. I mean, it's. The, the way this shot, the way the, the, the sequence is done and designed, it is absolutely masterful. Oh, wow, that Brilliant. car in front of them is looking back and going, you know, wasn't there the car in front of them with, yep. The, yep. with the one guy? And they're looking back and all this action is going on. And some parts, they are actually crossing like cliffs where the yep. guy's hanging off. If you fall off, you're falling all the way down there. So And, and uh, you know, this is the point in the movie where my mother said to me, when my mother and I went and saw this movie, we're driving home after seeing it. My mom's very quiet. And I said, Mom, what'd you think of the movie? And she goes, that, would, that, that, that just could never happen. And I said, well, what do you mean? My mom has no imagination. Well, he could never hang on by his bullwhip to the back of that truck because the dirt, the gravel would get in his mouth and he would let go. This is what my mom came. And I go, Mom, the power of God coming out of the Ark of the Covenant. She's like, oh, no, that could happen. Moses part of the Red Sea after all. But if you had that much gravel coming in your face, you'd let go. Well, and we've got the picture of that scene up. It's, but again, this is a testament to the way they made films at the time because, like today, this would have been done. There's a million different ways they could have shot this. The only way they could shoot this at that time was they literally had to have a guy hanging onto a rope that it was being dragged from the back of a truck. Now, when you're watching the movie, you can tell this truck is not moving very fast. Like, it's not moving very, and, and granted, that's what, but you got to appreciate this was 
a like literally a guy hanging onto a rope by being dragged behind the back of a truck and that's how they shot it also what i really like about this film is that you know in other movies you have the low tier enemies and usually the hero or whatever wipes them wipes the floor with them in this movie indiana felt like he was always in danger yeah. like yes he, that guy who get, got on the truck we didn't meet him before but he almost had indiana that's what i like about all the enemies it's all fair game in here even if they were less lesser known oh. i felt like he was always in danger uh, throughout the whole movie yeah he gets shot in the arm and then the guy's just pummeling where he gets shot i mean that's another thing about this film that i mean sure there's a lot of there's a lot of unrealism in this movie, but for the most part, it's, but it stays grounded to the se in the sense that there's always peril for the main character. Like, you know, as much as I love the John Wick franchise, I mean, at the end of the, the fight in John Wick 3 is pretty brutal, the end scene. But for the most part, when he invades some territory or whatever, John Wick just caps 30 guys and you never feel that he's in danger. But yeah, but here's the thing with John Wick, his his. His is methodical, his plan. Indiana kind of feels like he just puts himself there, he gets caught or whatever, and he has to make the best out of the well, situation. Well, he said it in the movie. I don't know, I'm just making this yeah, up. Yeah, he's just like going by, he has no like, I'm gonna sneak through the back when it comes to these enemies. He's just caught up a lot of the times and he just makes the best out of the situation, yeah. which is great. It's kind of like MacGyver sort of thing, except, you know, fighting. By the way, enemies. when one of my favorite lines, but I might even be thinking of the right movie. When Sala says, which I believe is in this one. It's a little bit later on. I think it's before they get on the boat. When Saul was like, my friends, I am so pleased you are not dead. No, that's, one of my favorite lines ever. That's from this movie. Yeah, right. The, right the, and that is just before it, they get on the boat. Yeah, right? they get on the boat. They get on the Bantu wind. Yes. Oh, my God. <laughs> you know, I am that, so pleased you are not uh, dead. We're, we're, we're slowly coming up to the one part that bothered me in this movie. And uh -oh. I'll just have to say, Aquaman, Namor, what is, what's going on? How'd you get in that submarine? Okay. Yeah, I mean, yes. Okay, this is an argument. This is an argument that's been had. So they get the they get the Ark of the Covenant on the Bantu wind, and uh, the 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 Nazis the U boat finds them. And the big controversy in this movie is they never went, they never dove. That Indiana Jones climbs on the U boat and he hangs on the periscope for dear life, and that the submarine never submerged. I want that, to think that it's a merge. Don't and we he see him breath. get in the submarine? He does not get in the submarine. Wait, not. are we sure? Yeah, he, he does, does not, not get in the submarine. I must be not but now that I, I have done research, and I've read about this. They uh, submarines like that in those times, they all worked on battery power when they went underwater, so they tended not to do that in times of. I get it. There's no war. That makes sense. So so there's no reason for them to submerge. Yeah. Nobody was chasing them. There had been no war declared. You know So that's why I believe I, a lot of people, he could never that hold That makes on. sense now. That makes so sense I'm just now. saying. But the, the first shot of the captain of that submarine, I actually had to rewind it because I actually thought Indiana took someone's uniform and snuck into the sub. Because for uh, it's just a quick shot of him going through the submarine. I actually said, is that Harrison Ford? I had to rewind yeah, we, it. By the way, we got people in the live chat saying, he does get in the sub. He steals a Nazi uniform. That's after it docks. Well, I remember, oh, that's right. That is after yeah, it docks. After yeah, it, yeah, it's after it docks. We're talking about before. That's yeah, right, before that's they right. hit that And place. by the way, another thing about this, even the captain, that badass black dude who's the captain yeah. of the Bantuan, that guy's awesome. Like, he has that. He has a great face and his... His his uh, accent. I love the way he speaks. Yeah, like, I, I, I don't know too. where in Africa that character is supposed to be from, but he's awesome. Yeah. And uh, she'll fair, she'll she'll fetch a fair price, uh, you know. <laughs> but by the way, going back to the boat, another one of the coolest moments ever, the whole time. As she's like, they're still on the boat, and he, she's Marion's attending to Indy. He's like, ah, uh She's well, where doesn't it hurt? And he's here, <laughs> and then she gives him a kiss there. And, here and here i mean that was a great moment no the great moment Classic when they finally scene. are re reunited they actually yeah. have a romance and then she spins she spins the mirror around and smacks him in the face oh my god that cuts was so the exterior funny. of the ship ah and this is another thing this film never is without humor there's humor all throughout this movie and a lot of people complain like i don't like marvel movies because there's always humor in them this film has humorous moments combined with action very in in a very deft fashion it, it, and the marvel movies do that quite well as well i actually think this one did it better because it fit the flow like nothing no joke felt out of place nope it felt very personable to the character 
Like it felt like, oh yeah, that's what he would say or she would say at that moment. Sometimes in Marvel, it's kind of like, there's often times where I'm like, it's a serious conversation. All of a sudden, the funniest joke right there. It kind of doesn't. It's fit. true. I mean, you know I mean? The, the, well, the Marvel movies are you feel the you feel the screenwriter. Right here, exactly. the the script is so it's just so great. I mean, right. it, it works so well. And you know what else I love? When they get the Ark of the Covenant, like in the ship's hold, and you hear that piece of music, wah, 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 yeah. wah, wah. you see the 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 Nazi the Nazi uh, being burned symbol, off. The symbol being, being burned, burned off. off. I love that. So showing you that uh, no, there is something supernatural at play here absolutely and these guys are messing with things they should not mess with and by the way uh, unlike tote you've also got other nazis the other nazi faces like some of the every movie is made better with nazi villains because nazis are the best villains ever you yeah. can't get better villains and the nazis the actors they cast to play nazis in this are so good like the i am uncomfortable with the salt of this hebrew ritual <laughs> that nazi with this great square i mean it's they're the best and you you can't wait to see all these mfers die and melt I, I just i can't every time i watch the movie i'm like man they were well cast you can't wait to watch all these guys die so now we get to the point where they're now transporting the ark mm -hmm. and again by the way indy has done done the same shit belloc he did all the work Yep, the, he did all the work, and and Belloc has snatched the Ark away from Indiana Jones. Mm. So the re repeating motifs leads up to the ultimate troll. I think the final troll of Belloc towards uh, Indiana, where he actually tests his manhood for a second. Right? What? Like when he's about to shoot, and he's like, "Go ahead." Oh yeah, yeah. He's like, Wait, "Go ahead." Go yeah, ahead. He's got the bazooka. He's going to take it out. And again, this tells us something about Indy. You were talking about this earlier, Ray, about. He is really into this stuff because like Belloc is even calling him out. Just go ahead. It's, it's only the Ark of the Covenant. It's only the thing that mankind has been searching for for 3,000 years. Go ahead. We are just passing through and then, history. And Belloc even pulls a gun and starts pointing at the Nazis, telling them to back off, back the F off. Oh go my ahead. God, that was so good. And he knew Indy wouldn't fire. Yeah. And, and how, again, great character moments, great yeah. writing. And you know, that speech he gives. You know, you and I are just passing through history. Yes. But this, this is history. And when so Indy good. puts down that bazooka, it was like one second where you see that he does something with his face where you could tell the wind was just knocked out of him. Totally. Like, oh, fuck. Like, he got me there. He got me here. And not a moment. Like, as soon as he drops the bazooka, the Nazis are on him. Because the worst thing to de be defeated by a villain is physical, but mentally be defeated by a villain, that's another level. Oh, and Indy's been beaten by Belloc every step of the way. But every this was the way. ultimate. Yeah. Like, he even played him. It's like, oh, Mike, like, he's, Andy's got him dead to rights. Bazooka pointed at him the whole bit. Can't get at him before he pulls that trigger. And he still manages to outsmart him. In front of his girl. In front of his girl. <laughs> no greater oh, emasculation man. can there be. The balls of Indy just went, <laughs> went just so super small. Yeah. <clears throat> but now and now we get to the we get to the big the big moment that was oh, immortalized in Big Bang Theory. Oh. Big Bang Theory, the big Indiana Jones speech that that Mayim Bilik or whatever is how you pronounce her name gives. And she points out the fact, and 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 I know all of us geeks, that Indiana Jones has no agency in the climax of this movie. He's literally tied to a post, and he doesn't do anything. Except tell Marion to close her eyes. Yeah, that, and so which is a pretty interesting way to end this movie. So Indiana Jones and Marion Ravenwood tied to a post, and they can't do anything but watch. That's and and it and it's so great because now Belloc is dressed as a rabbi. You know, ready to perform the the Hebrew ritual. You know, the Nazis are all looking around. They're all uncomfortable. You know, because <laughs> they've all read Mein Kampf. You know, and they're 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 looking at what's going to happen. And Belloc, though, here's the one place in the movie where Belloc isn't as smart as Indiana Jones because Indiana Jones knows. Don't look at it. Yep. Belloc doesn't know this. Somehow Man cannot. Behold the glory of God with his eyes. Uh, and you know what? Indy knows. Indy knows. He talks about hocus pocus mumbo jumbo. I don't believe in it. Apparently he believes in it enough. He believes in God. He believes in the power of God. Belloc doesn't. Belloc, you think he might, but he doesn't.
But it brings up something interesting because you're right. At the end of the day, you could make the argument that if after those government guys came to the school to talk to Indy and he said, I'm busy, this movie still would have ended the same way. <laughs> With the Nazis at some point cracking open the thing and being melted. The difference is that Indy wouldn't have ended up with Marion, that he then somehow loses again and doesn't get her back till Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but that then he is there to collect the Ark at the end. Yeah. But aside from that, that movie would have ended if he had never gone there. Eventually, the, the Nazis, eventually they find the Ark. Eventually, they take it back to that island to conduct their, their experiment, their moment of opening it, and they would have all been melted. But that's it. But see, to me, it emphasizes the idea that to me, the movies are not about the destination. It's about the journey. Yes. And that's what makes Indiana Jones so special. It's that journey, that adventure he goes on. And again, yeah, at the end of the day, the only real ramification is that he gets to collect the Ark of the Covenant and that's it. But still, it was the adventure, the getting from A to B. So, I mean, I don't know, that's how I saw it. I agree with, with you, John. And you know what's so great about this? At the end of the day, the greed and avarice, I love this whole sequence because when they finally open the Ark, and Rene Belloc, who said, oh my God, we're going to have untold riches and they think they're going to be able to level mountains like they say early on when he reaches down and scoops up just sand like that maybe those are the tablets that the 10 commandments were on now Talk they're just laughing he starts laughing like the whole thing is and and it, you see the defeat on belloc's face and then of course things start to churn the the power starts to manifest and then they all think oh my god here it's we are beautiful. it's beautiful and it's so cool you see the angels spinning around and the full-on power of gozer the gozerian comes out of the, the you know i mean it, it is it is you know ilm working and 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 i remember like watching this movie for the first time you again again you got a sense of wonder these are powers that man was not meant to disturb, as Sala said earlier yeah. in the movie. And you see those powers. The promise of those powers are made manifest, and it is not disappointing. And, and can we talk just for a second that to this day, while they do not look real, those effects of the Nazis melting. Oh, that was great. Are, is effective. And Belloc blowing up. Oh, because he went through the steps of what. I would think in my head, because I've never seen it, a face would look like if it was slowly being burnt off. It went from the top, not upper so skin, slowly. <laughs> upper skin, and then you saw the other layer, yeah. and then you saw beneath that, and it was just disgusting in a way. And, they scream and, and as a kid, you're watching that. That was a little traumatizing. It was, I mean, yeah, it was so awesome. And by the way, again, John Williams scored, na, yeah. na, na, it just na, makes me, it makes me want to see this movie modernized a little bit, just just to see, I know you guys well, don't like Green Indiana Man. I know, five. I know that. We got Indiana Jones Five coming. It's kind of modernized version. Of I mean, but this movie, because like some of those parts could be so well done, and like the scope could have been, you know. But no, no, I'm not asking. Coming because... in 2023, George Lucas's special editions of the you Indiana Jones movie. people. I'm sorry. I just see that's why. That's why I refuse <laughs> okay. a lot of the times to watch like movies. Because I've already tasted the newer movies. I know. Well, that's and it's sometimes hard to go back. Same thing with the Star Wars. I haven't seen what's the first uh, thing of Star Wars. The first Star New Wars. Hope. Uh, New Hope. I haven't even watched that. I've made it through 15 minutes of the beginning and I just fall asleep every time. What? I'm sorry. I thought you guys knew that. I thought you guys knew that I like the prequels because they're newer. Maybe I'll go but, back but and watch I, that first but, one. But I will. I want to say you you make a very good point because. You know, when we who grew up with these movies, the technology was advancing as we watched them. I mean, ILM, motion control photography, the way it was done in Star Wars didn't exist until then. The Dykstra Flex cameras and computers being able to repeat shots so you could combine things in camera. That didn't exist. Now, like you pointed out, I, I mean, I remember in, in 1993 seeing Jurassic Park, ILM, seeing the Brachiosaur take the leaves off and, you know, Sam Neill... Uh, it had taken almost a century to see photorealistic dinosaurs. You can't go back. You could not go back and watch the beast, a black and white stop motion monster movie. But for this time, I will say this movie, the effects were good enough for me to sit through it and not be like very critical of everything. Because the story, the funness, the adventure, the action, 
was so packed in and paced so well for, for me at least someone who would fall asleep through any dialogue just three minutes of dialogue there's a slight chance i might sleep <laughs> and not make it through the movie all right, right. well guys oh okay, god then well I, of course we just gotta say one last thought of course then the iconic ending where's the arc now top, top men. men i mean that and then of course it's being it's been spoofed many times since then we see it boxed up in a crate and moved and buried into a warehouse filled with crates. I had questions because I haven't seen any of the other ones. So I had questions, but I was, you know. I and did. then we see it again in Kingdom of the Crystal we Skull. We do. They come across again. Is there a story to, like, to that warehouse? demystify it. No. Okay. Yeah, it's, there it's, should be, though. Yeah. There's no story to that warehouse at all? No, nope, not that we know of. There's no mention of it nope. anymore after that. No, well, in Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, which happened many, many, many years later, they're in that same warehouse again, and they come across the crate, but that's... Mm. And they play that same music. Oh, yeah. Uh, all right. With that down, guys, let's now spend the rest of our time here in this meeting of the movie club to hear from you guys about your thoughts on this movie. Let's jump over here. We're going to hear first from our member, Sam Fisher, who says, I love Raiders because it pulls off this death of the female lead and it's totally believable only for her living to be in the mid part, the midpoint twist. I was just saying that a little bit earlier myself. I like that. It The movie convinced me she was dead. And then I was as surprised as Indy when we discovered that she was oh, still yeah. alive. I love that moment. All right, James L.H. writes, guys, I love Star Wars. But Raiders made four to star. Between Star Wars and Raiders, I recall him in lowly ranked Force 10 from Navarone, Hanover Street, Frisco Kid. Well, did you never see the other George Lucas masterpiece that he American did? American Graffiti. With with Ron Howard. And uh, that's when he that, played Bob Falfa. Because I believe it was that. Like they were looking at Kurt Russell for Han Solo. And I can't remember what the circumstances were, but they had. They brought in Harrison Ford because he had worked with him on American Graffiti. Kurt Russell screen tested for Han Solo. Yeah, they brought him in. They did all that stuff. They brought in Harrison Ford just to read for other people auditioning. And then ultimately they went with Harrison Ford. Yep. And the rest was history, as they say. All right, next up, City of Swift writes. Funny enough, my family watched these VHS tapes in reverse. The Last Crusade was definitely my favorite. Raiders of the Lost Ark, a close second. Well, here's the funny thing. They, they say that... Temple of Doom is actually a prequel to Raiders of the Lost Ark. I've never heard Spielberg or Lucas definitively say that. Well, it takes place the year before. Does it take place Yeah, the it year says before? it takes place in 1935. Okay, well, there you go. So you literally could watch Raiders or Temple of Doom in whatever order you want, but you have to have watched Raiders, I think, to get the full effect of Last Crusade. I think you got to do that. But yes, it is pretty cool. You could have watched them in any order. It's not a good time, Sidious. And you watch them on VHS. All right. James L.H. writes, also has the coolest fight, or maybe I should say non-fight scene versus the swordsman, plus the now uh, infamous behind the scenes of Ford having dysentery. And by the way, then they did a callback to that in, I believe it was... It's uh, in Temple of Doom. Temple of Doom. When the two swordsmen come. Tries to do the same thing, and they kind of played a joke out of it. His gun's not there. Which was a great, great moment. Oh, yeah, that part. Yeah. Where she, oh, that was so great. That so, wait a minute. Did you see that part? I did, but I, I when you guys are describing it, I just couldn't. I, this was my first time watching it. I I mean, I can't memorize everything. But I do remember that part because that guy did a, the, the, the showy thing. Yeah. yeah. Like, And you're like, oh, shit, what is he going to do with his whip? And he just takes out his gun and shoots him. I think he won my heart right there. And this, by the this way. Character, so nonchalant yes right murdered and then turned okay now what was i doing he just took a man's life uh, i can't be bothered in front of bang. hundreds of people in front of tons of witnesses <laughs> just canceled that dude's subscription to life right there all right and next up city of swift writes upon re-watching this i was taken aback uh at, by how at times this movie is very ominous and spooky in a gets in your head kind of way it absolutely is yeah like there were this movie doesn't work unless it catches you on the creepiness side of it too, of, of the tension and like, especially when they start getting into the supernatural stuff, it's got, it's the stuff that Brody warns Indy of yep. earlier in the film. In the well of souls, there's the giant snake coming out of the mouth, oh. which is great. I mean, it's really oh. horrifying stuff. It's great. Yeah. It's great. All right. Love next it. up, we've got 
James L.H. who writes, in the 80s, I read everything Lucas Spielberg. Spielberg, considering Bond and Lucas, says, I have something better. So many stories. For a long time, Indy was my second trilogy behind Star Wars until Lord of the Rings arrived. I mean, the Indiana Jones trilogy, I, I mean, it's the great, they are the greatest adventure films ever. They, and again, we can't, and I defy anybody to think of this, you can't even go to watch a movie like Uncharted without coming out and trying to measure it against the bar of Indiana Jones, which of course is not fair to any movie that's an adventure film. Well, but the writing in the film, it's not just Spielberg's direction, it's the actual script yes, too. That were, that were great and powerful, wonderful characters, great action, great pacing, the whole bit. All right, next up, Aiden Foley writes, Sala is probably one of the most lovable characters ever put to film. He absolutely is. Uh, if Lucasfilm announced a Sala spinoff, don't lie, we'd all be there. I would like to think so, but I don't think so. I mean, yeah. I would be there, and I think it was only appropriate that Sala is back in uh, Last Crusade and that he is one of the, like, there is something so perfect about the ending of The Last Crusade as they're all riding off into the sunset and Sala is one of them. Brody's there, Sala's there, Indy's there, and his dad is there. And there's something so perfect about that, about Sala being a part of that. But he's so beloved. And that's why when you go to the Indiana Jones attraction at Disney, who's the voice of the narrator guiding you through as you're going in? It's Sala, it's John Reese davies which is actually very, very appropriate. Okay, uh, let's see here. Um, where are we at? Right, Rob, I'm not gonna lie. I actually thought he was gonna be a villain in, up until the end. Oh, Stala? Uh, yeah, just because I didn't know who to trust in this movie. Sure. And I, I just wasn't sure yet until. But that's good. That's yeah. good that you felt that way. It's good that you're off kilter. Okay. Uh, next up, we've got. Where are we at? We're at uh, the man with the master plan, right? Oh. The music is iconic. Absolutely, it is. Keep up the good work, and please tell. And please tell me Ray took a nap in between shows. It's going to be a long night. Nope, Ray had work to do. I was just thinking about that. It's going to be tough. I'm going uh, to crash. I'm going to try to nap there. in the car on the way there. Actually, you know, we got a conference call. We got to be on oh, in the okay. car too. But but we'll we'll try to keep it short okay. so you can crash for a bit. All right. Next up, we got Chris uh, Barcinas who writes: the first moment we see Indy use the whip in the first ten minutes, you know the movie was going to be awesome. No, it's true. It's out. But by the way, I will. I know nobody likes to hear this, but I should point it out. In that iconic opening moment, when we still have only seen his back silhouette, and the guy pulls the gun, he pulls the gun, and there's at least I want to say seven minutes between when the guy pulls the gun, Andy grabs his whip, turns around, and goes "fuck you!" Like the guy easily could have just gone bang. I mean, it wasn't that fast, but still. <laughs> Incredible opening, great moment with the win. Well, maybe he was going to talk to him about doing something, like forcing uh, yeah, him to do maybe. something, you know? You know, my only thing about the other, my other thing about the film is since I didn't know Indy and all of his posters, he has the whip. Yeah. I actually thought it was going to be throughout the whole film. I liked how sparingly he used it, but I actually thought it would be more of a, I don't even see him with the whip after the movie. I don't be like, man, that guy is good with the whip. I don't even think about that, which is crazy because of all the posters I see with him using that as his uh, signature true. weapon. All right, next up, uh, we've got Harv's K who writes, still my favorite Spielberg flick, but after 40 years influencing every adventure and action film since, it's true, can this hold up to newbies' eyes like Ray or will it feel a bit too slow or even archaic? I would make the argument that other than the visual effects, which do show their wear. I mean, particularly like when they when the good guys find the Well of Souls and they're digging at night and you see like the storm in the background. Right. That was some pretty obvious green screen. Yeah, and the pole too. When there's gone the pole, I was like, okay, you just have to suspend your belief. For yeah, just for a minute. But I would, I would argue that aside from the obviously dated visual effects, this movie is still better than anything, any adventure film that comes out today. Plus, I would say that because it it's set in 1936, when you watch this, if you buy into it, because it takes place in the past, I think that setting helps the the, the datedness of the visual effects. Oh, yeah. By the way, CJ Chaos brought up something, too. Like, remember they announced a while ago this big immersive Indiana Jones video game? Still waiting on that. I don't know what the... Have you heard any updates on that one, Ray, for a long time? I or? didn't care about it. 
but now I do. Yeah, the right. tribes. <laughs> yeah, right. Now I do because there's going to be some swinging, some running from the tribe, some you whipping, know, some some yeah. shooting and whip stuff. Oh my God, let's do it! Just They're bring it out already. Go. <laughs> All right, let's see. Next up, Ben Rayner writes. Uh, Indy or Han, who do you prefer? I say Indy myself. I mean, they're two iconic characters. Who wins in a fight? Indiana Jones wins in a fight. Who wins in a gunfight? Han Solo wins in a gunfight. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. But Indy's they are more hands-on, I think. Yeah. I like the way he's more hands-on. They're very different characters. Yeah. yeah. Indy's a professor. Han's a nerf herder. Right. I mean, right? right. I That's mean, right. They're and scruffy great. looking. And scruffy looking. But both of them have the same amount of women. Yeah, they I all, bet they you. All get, they both all of them are ladies. top notch. They're ladies' men. Yeah. No right. doubt. Next up, uh, we got Ryan Loner who writes During the tomb escape, watch the shadow of the rock Indy pushes out. It's rubber and you can see it bounce off the ground. <laughs> yeah. But it's like supposed to be like an 800 pound rock, right? It's supposed to be like an 800 pound rock. All right. Uh, next up, we've got K Major who writes. Uh, my rankings for many years was Crusade, Temple, and Raiders as a child. Once I hit my teens, it went Crusade, Raiders, Temple. These movies define my childhood. Ford is still one of my all-time favorite actors. And, you know, it's it's a funny thing because, and by the way, my, I have them ranked the same way, Crusade, Raiders, and Temple. That That's my rankings as well. But, uh, I mean, look, when we think of Harrison Ford, obviously we think of Star Wars and Indiana Jones. You take away Star Wars and Indiana Jones. Harrison Ford has still had a Hall of Fame career. You take away Star Wars and Indiana Jones, and he has still had a Hall of Fame career, in my in my assessment. Oh, he's, uh, things it. like the Mosquito Coast or Presumed Innocent. There's Air so Force many One. movies. Air Force <laughs> One, get off my plane. Or the two Jack Ryan movies, Patriot Games and Clear and Present Danger. Yeah, I mean, it just it, it's, it's kind of like Tom Brady that way. Working Girl. Take away the first three Super Bowls from Tom Brady. He's like you. They, ESPN did the same on Tom Brady. They broke his career into three eras. He had a Hall of Fame career in every single one of the eras yeah. by themselves. And that's Harrison Ford's career, man. All right, next up, uh, we go to Fanimator writes. While I like Raiders, I much prefer Last Crusade. Me too. Uh, great opening scene, fun adventure. Seven point five out of ten. I mean, I. I, I prefer Last Crusade as in it's my favorite, but I don't vastly prefer it. Like Raiders is a near perfect action adventure. How, how yes. many years is Last Crusade uh, released after this? It was 89. It was eight oh, years later. Oh, so you actually do see advancements in like the effects and stuff from yes, this movie. Yes, but, but the effects in Last Crusade are a little janky too. Oh, okay. Well, you know what? <laughs> yeah, but they're ambitious. Yeah, they are. Yeah. They're always, always pushing the envelope yeah. about what was yeah. possible. At yeah. that time. Yeah. All right. Next up. Uh, Ryan Loner writes, the location in Hawaii of the vine swing into the lake in the opening now has a rope hanging there. I've done that swing. Oh, that's perfect. Like if you were a location <laughs> for that moment in Raiders of the Lost Ark, you make that swing into the water. Absolutely. And you keep that there as a tourist trap. That, that's awesome. You got to ride it, Ryan. All right. Harfs K writes. Uh, what do you guys think of the theory that nothing indie did matter? Nazis still would have ended up with the Ark, and the Ark still would have wiped them out. Well, there's two things. There are two repercussions which we talked about earlier. Number one, he did get Marion back into his life, so that was one big thing. Number two, it's who ends up with possession of the Ark of the Covenant, and that was strictly because Indy was able to follow it all the way through to the end. But yes, the Nazis still would have got it. And they still would have melted. But then the question is, what would have happened with the arc afterwards? And that was completely determined by this movie, what Indy did. But I would also argue that it's also, in a way, a spiritual quest for Indiana Jones himself. Yes. He has to redeem what he didn't, what he'd done to Marion. He has to fulfill his old mentor, Abner Ravenwood's dream. You know, he has to do all of these things, which he does. And in a way, I mean, they don't belabor this point, but perhaps he now is more of a, he has a belief he, he's learned that there really is. He goes, I don't believe in all this hocus pocus. Well, now he will because he witnessed Well, he didn't witness it, but he saw the results of it. All right. Hocus next pocus up. is real, John. And that is Indy now. All right. Uh, the Jughead one writes one or two. Hi, John, Robin Ray. I love Raiders of the Lost Ark, a modern classic. It reminds me of another modern classic. Doc Savage, the man of bronze. Ron Ellie. Wow. Eli, Ron Eli. Yeah. Eli. Produ yeah, produced by George Powell. Now, you remember Dwayne The Rock Johnson? They announced that Dwayne The Rock Johnson was going to play he Doc Savage. He would be awesome as Doc Savage. And they they held on to that for a couple of years before they finally said, yeah, yeah, that's kind of fallen off the wayside. 
Dwayne Dark Johnson would have been a great Doc Savage if they ever got around to doing that. All right, next up. Oh, sorry, that was one of two. Then he says two of two. Uh, hey, John, do you, Rob, and Ray have any cheesy classics that all three of you enjoy? Enjoy the Batman tonight. Love and respect you from the UK. Appreciate that, Chuck. We're here to talk about Raiders of the Lost Ark here today on Movie Club. But thank you for asking nonetheless. All right. Uh, Moda Awesome writes. Motossum writes. Uh, first time watching Raiders of the Lost Ark, and I loved it. It's all thanks to the coolest movie club. Thanks again for all you do. And Aww. that is awesome to hear because... One of the, the ideas of Movie Club is, number one, just get together and talk about the movies we love of the past right. 25 years. Yeah. Awesome. Number two, get you to go back and revisit maybe some of these awesome movies you haven't watched in a while. I know that's been one of the coolest things for me because I, I re-watched Gladiator the day before we did Movie Club. I re-watched Batman Begins before we did Movie Club. So it's to encourage us to go back and revisit these awesome classics before we get together and talk about them. But number three is if you're somebody like Ray, <laughs> it gives you an excuse. You know what? Movie Club's coming up about this movie, and I've never seen it. Now's as good a time as any for me to check it out. So I love hearing that, Moto Awesome. I'm glad you're here joining us today and that you watch it for the first time. All right. Uh, let's see. Gary Meyer writes, Do you think Lucas and Spielberg had any idea how iconic this character would become? No. I mean, I think whenever any movie maker, any filmmaker makes any movie, you know, Aaron Cummings who, by the way, was just in The Rookie with Nathan Fillion this week. Um, but she, I remember once, told me, she and I were having a conversation about this one. She goes, every writer and every director and every actor, the moment they know they're doing a certain movie, they're already practicing their Oscar acceptance speech in their head. Yep. And I can tell you that's absolutely true. I've done it myself. <laughs> Delusions of grandeur. Um you hope for greatness, but no, they could have never known that this would be, become the greatest adventure films of all time. The most beloved character, maybe, of all time. In they Indiana know now, because they're, they're doing that in D5. That's they're doing in D5. <laughs> By the way, it's going to be really interesting. Look, Steven Spielberg is the greatest filmmaker of all time. It's going to be really interesting to see an Indiana Jones movie done by a new director for the first time in history. And a great director in James Mangold. That's why I'm excited for it. Yeah. yeah and a great excellent. writer, too. Yeah, excellent. All right. Next up, we got uh, Rhett Proctor, who writes, I watched Raiders of the Lost Ark the other day, and I still love it to this day. The scene where the Nazis all die, and the one guy has his face melted off. It's still my favorite scene. The one guy. A couple of them had their faces melted off, and then a lot of the Nazi soldiers just had bolts of lightning go through their belly. And belly. Belloc explodes. It's like, you know, hey, Nazis, if you could do me a favor, could you stand in a nice straight line? I just I only got so many shots of lightning to shoot out. Which, again, another callback earlier to the film to the classroom scene. It's like, what's that coming out of the arc? Uh, light, lightning, power, power of God. Yeah, that's great. And all of those like, things. And it was all of those things wrapped into one, baby. All right. I'm glad you watched it again, Rhett. Next up, Ryan Loner writes. Uh, everyone knows Tom Selleck was the original choice to play Indiana Jones, which he was. We, I can't believe we didn't mention that earlier. No, that's true. He, of course, he had uh, scheduling conflicts come up because he got cast to play in this little TV show called Magnum P.I. I think it worked out for everybody. <laughs> uh, and he wasn't in there. Anyway, everybody knows Tom Selleck was the original choice for Indy. But how about this? Danny DeVito would have played Sala if not for commitments to Taxi. I didn't know that. I didn't know that either. That's interesting. Do you guys in the live chat know if that's a true piece of trivia? If I, that I, is true... <clears throat> I mean, Sala, John Reese davies was a much better choice for that role. Yeah, I think so, too. Just because of who he is and everything like I that. I mean, I but... would never believe Danny DeVito is the best digger in Cairo. No, no, I wouldn't have <laughs> bought that either. But if that is true, that is a very interesting piece of trivia. Yeah. All right. Next up, we got uh, Kevin Joyce, who writes, Virtually every treasure hunt slash ancient world globetrotting adventure game, film or series since 1981, owes its look and motifs to this movie. It's true. Pitfall. They the Atari all, 2600. Yeah. yeah. I still remember playing that as a kid. Yeah. It's, it's all the, it, 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 Indiana Jones and the Indiana Jones films are the template of every adventure film that has ever come since. Laura Croft, Tomb Raider. It's all based on Indiana all, Jones. It all comes from Indiana Jones. Rambo 2. <laughs> <laughs> Uncharted. All of it. All based on, but it's true. So you got to know, like today, they know if you try to make a high, fantasy sword and sorcery movie you got to be careful because you're going to get compared to lord of the rings and no matter how good you are it's not going to compare favorably no you try to make a big adventure film like this 
you got to take a big gulp and realize we're going to be compared to Indiana Jones and we're not going to live up in that comparison. We're not going to look good in that comparison. So it is something that a lot of filmmakers, I think, have to keep in mind. All right. Next up, uh, the Jughead Run writes, uh, Paul Freeman, Belloc, uh, John, uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Is that the name of the actor, Paul yeah. Freeman? Nice call out on that one, Jughead, for the actor who played such a great, again, he deserves an honorary Academy Award for never breaking character when that fly went into his damn mouth. All right, and then finally, Steel, Steel, uh, Steel Smith just sends in a Super Chat badge to be supportive. Thank you for that, Steel. Appreciate that. And guys, that'll do it for today's meeting of Movie Club. Thank you so much for coming along and being with us here today, guys. Just, you know, put your seats away, return your cups on the table. Uh, that would be fantastic. And don't forget to join us again for our movie club next week. Our movie next week is I Don't Know. We haven't come up with one yet. We'll make an announcement tomorrow on the John Campus Show what next week's movie will be. Feel free to email me if you have some suggestions. I want to thank the guy sitting over here, Mr. Robert Meyer Burnett. Robert, where can people follow you online? Well, John, you can find me on Twitter at Burnett RM. Find me on Instagram at RM Burnett or find me on my own YouTube channel, The Burnett Work. But mostly, John, you can find me here. And sitting right beside him, you can also find him here all the time. He's Ray Ora. And Ray, where can people find you elsewhere online? Ray Ora with a zero. And I'll also be trying to look for an Indiana Jones action figure. There you there's go. There's good ones. There's some good. There's some very good ones if you want to get into the 1-6 market. Also, guys, don't forget, uh, for those of you who are watching this show on, the, on March 1st, uh, if you are watching this on March 1st, a little bit later tonight, we're on our way now. We're leaving right now. We're about to go get in the car and leave. We're going to go watch <laughs> The Batman. So make sure you check out, keep your eye open on the YouTube channel tonight because we're putting up our out-of-the-theater reaction to The Batman. We cannot wait. Anyway, guys, my name's John Campia. That'll do it for us for now. Thanks a lot for being here. And until next time, my friends, bye-bye. <laughs>